So today, here we are. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. And so let's begin reading together here in Genesis chapter 2 at verse 18. I'll read to verse 25 and we'll get into our study. Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 18 and reading to verse 25. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper who will consistently nag him. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. That was my own personal note. I shouldn't have said that. I will, I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, they shall become one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Well, this morning we're going to begin a series on marriage and the family. You already know that we've been studying through the Gospel of Matthew. And as we arrived at chapter uh, 19, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus gives instruction concerning divorce. Now in chapter 18, he'd been speaking strongly about the importance of forgiveness. And we had already seen when we went through chapter, uh, chapter 18 that he taught about the proper way to encourage reconciliation between believers. And then he went on, to speak about the importance of, of uh, retaining a willingness to forgive. So with this knowledge of reconciliation and forgiveness, it's interesting how, how the Spirit led Matthew to immediately begin to speak or to write concerning divorce. You see, the teaching that, that Matthew records for us really gives to us insight into the results of not forgiving one another. And he does that in the context of marriage as well as divorce. And so I want to share with you about marriage and the family. And I want to do that for a specific reason. It's my hope to encourage those who are married to hold fast in their marriages. You see, divorce can be an option, of course, but it's not the ideal solution for marriage problems. We're going to see that in Matthew when we return there, that there are biblical reasons for divorce, and we will examine those reasons closely. But we uh, do so considering what Jesus plainly states is God's plan for marriage. Because in Matthew 19, in verses 4 through 6, Jesus said, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. And therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So Jesus went on to say that divorce is permitted, but he also made it clear that divorce was permitted because of hardness of heart. So in light of his teaching on a, a brother sinning against another believer, Jesus' words give us insight. You see, when there's no repentance, there's no reconciliation, there will be no healing, and there'll be no restoration. And so Jesus had been speaking concerning repentance and forgiveness and restoration. But if you don't have that attitude and you have marital problems, you can enter into a divorce. And so what I want to do in this series is to share messages that encourage us to take marriage seriously. And we need to see marriage through the lens of Scripture. We need to remember what God calls marriage. 
You see, when you look in the Old Testament, in, Ma in Malachi chapter 2, verse 11, Malachi 2, 11 speaks of marriage as God's holy institution. It's the sacred union. It's a holy institution that God has ordained. And as God's holy institution, it is to be recognized as holy and it is to be regarded as sacred. You see, ultimately, marriage represents the union of Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. We see that in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, where Paul said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He went on to say, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So as we begin this series on marriage, I begin it by saying to you something very obvious. I don't speak as an expert. I speak as a fellow traveler because I have in no way arrived. And like many of you in this room, I am continually adjusting and attempting to grow in my relationship with my spouse. So by way of introduction, let's begin by saying this. In our day, the institution of marriage has finally been redefined worldwide. In our own nation, many of our leaders have rejected a concept of what was at one time referred to as a traditional family. Formerly, a traditional family unit was seen as a marriage between one man and one woman. The family could include children normally born to them after they had been married. And you need to understand how ingrained that was in my consciousness and in the consciousness of this nation because some of you may have heard this before. Uh, we used to say when we wanted to kind of tease one another, you know, we would look at one of our friends and we would say, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes so-and-so with a baby carriage. And we go, ah, and we thought that was very humorous and very deep. But we would do that because we would be teasing our friends. First comes love, first, next comes marriage. But you know what? What that did is that gave us the order of how things ought to be. Love, marriage, children. That's how we were raised. That's what we knew as a nation was proper. That you first had love. Then you had marriage. Then you had children. But in the era that we live in today, love, marriage is not necessary. You just have children. And what happens is family has been redefined. There's a new definition of family, and it doesn't even require marriage or even have children. Some people actually include their pets in their concept of family. They call themselves, you know, pet parents. Pet parents. I don't want to knock you, pet parent. <laughs> I really don't. I, 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 I do understand now, how a, a little cat or a little dog can be real. I do understand that. How come I would understand that? Uh, well, we had two cats. And my wife, Marie, would come walking around with this cat in her arms constantly. And I'd look at her and I'd say, man, you need grandchildren. You, you need grandchildren. Every once in a while, she'd pick me up and try and carry me around, too. It was just, it was really an uncomfortable thing. But I saw that. And, and today we have commercials where they, they refer to people as pet parents. And uh, there are a lot of people who consider themselves to now include an animal into what they call family. I'm telling you, we have readjusted the definition of family to basically incorporate any concept we might want to invent. And that's what has taken place. You see, for many, to be a family only requires people caring about one another and living under the same roof. We know that same-sex unions are presented now as, as equal, not simply equivalent, to heterosexual marriages. We know that this arrangement has gained the backing of modern psychology as well as courts of law. Legalized homosexual marriage exists in various countries throughout the world, and on June 26, 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that same-sex marriage is to be legal nationwide. And what has happened is we have redefined marriage. The redefinition has eliminated the sacredness of marriage and has reduced marriage to a civil matter. It's not regarded any longer as a holy institution. 
It is considered an option as well as a civil right. That is what has taken place. And so today, in light of that, we're going to begin a series on the subject of marriage and divorce from a Christian perspective. And somebody has defined a Christian marriage in this way. A, a Christian marriage is a total commitment of a man and woman to the person of Jesus and to one another. It is an exclusive and sacred union between one man and one woman, characterized by Christian principles found in the Bible and holding fast to the standards found in Scripture. And so we're looking at it from that perspective. We know that marriage is one of the ways that the Lord refines us. It's one of the ways that God can develop us into the person that He intends to make us into. Proverbs 27, 17 says it like this, As, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And we know that in the marital relationship that we sharpen one another. And so this is something that I wanted to spend time developing. Now, within the first three, rather first nine chapters of Genesis, there are three institutions that are established. The church, human government, and marriage. And all three of these institutions are basic foundations of what we call human civilization. And so we're going to be looking at one of these, and that would be the covenant of marriage. Now, as we begin, let me lay a little bit more of a foundation, then we'll get into some practical application. I, I would note with you that when you look at the book of Genesis, when you look in chapter 1, and you look at God's creation and all, when you look especially at verses uh, 24 and 25, God created animal life simultaneously, and he did so in great quantity. But on the other hand, man was created individually. You see that in, in Genesis 1, 26, as well as chapter 2, verse 7. And that's because man is the crown of God's creation. You see, Adam was created in the image of God. And so God had said in Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So he was made as God's representation in his similitude or his likeness, which makes him the crown of his creation. And so as God has created man, God had intent for man, and that's what we're going to be looking at today as we look at marriage. We'll do so by beginning at verse 18 in Genesis chapter 2, where it simply begins in this way. It says in Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now, when you look in the creation account in chapter 1 of Genesis, it, it simply says that God did something and then pronounced it good. And as I've said to you in the past, the first time you ever hear in Scripture God declaring something to be not good is here in this Scripture where he said it is not good that the man should be alone. That's the first thing that is declared to be not good. Man was created to enjoy fellowship with God and to have fellowship with others like him. And so his aloneness is going to be solved by the creation of someone like himself because that is what will complete him. It's like what it says in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, where, where it reads, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? It isn't good to be alone. And so God created us in order that we might have a companion to have fellowship with him and fellowship with someone like ourselves. And so he says in verse 18, God says, I will make him a helper comparable to him. So notice with me that marriage is God's plan, God's design. God sees the need and meets it. It's God who says, I will make him a helper. God initiated the first marriage. God knew Adam's need before Adam even realized that he had such a need. And God intended to meet that need. And what he did is he gave Adam, notice, a helper 
comparable to him. So that reveals that even when you have a relationship with the Lord, as Adam did, it is still possible to be alone. We're created for fellowship with God, but we are also created to have fellowship with others. And marriage is intended to fulfill our need to love others and to receive love from someone else. Again, marriage is God's idea. It's not man's invention intended to license and enslave women. God said it's not good that man should be alone, but he also went on to say, I will make him a helper. This is God's institution, and because marriage is God's institution, it is not to pick be taken lightly, and it's not to be reduced. There's no such thing as reducing marriage from the importance that God intended it to have. And so what God did is he gave Adam a helper, and this helper was comparable to him. Now, Eve was given to Adam. He gave him a gift, a gift from God, and she was the best gift that God could give. That's one of the secrets, by the way, if there were such a thing as a secret in my marriage. But that's one of the elements, if you will, in, in my marriage that, that I have placed as, as a very high, in a very high place. And that is that I see my wife as being a gift from God. I, I see my wife as being the one whom God said is the best gift he could give to me to help me not to be alone. And as a gift, she's not to be re-gifted. <laughs> or exchanged. She's the best. And I really believe that. I really, I really know that because I had sought the Lord. And I'll get into this in a moment. And I had said, God, you know my heart. And the Lord had a design that a certain kind of woman, this particular woman in my case, would be able to fill those empty places, empty spaces in my life. And, and so he brought this woman as a gift. God gave Adam this helper, and she was comparable to him. In Proverbs 19, verse 14, it says, Houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. And so the Lord gives to us a gift. Now, there are those who use their spouse in order that the spouse might support them as they are working towards a goal that they want to accomplish. But once the goal is achieved, they begin to look for someone who better matches the new them. And, and that's sad because I've seen that more than once where where we'll say in the case of a man who's going to school again, he goes to school to get his degree, his wife works, supports both of them, pays all the bills, does everything because their future together means so much to her. And then he ultimately gets his degree, gets his new position, and then has grown and feels that he's outgrown her because all she's doing is this kind of work and he's in this kind of field. And before you know it, he, he wants a, a different woman Malachi 2.14 says, The Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion, your wife by covenant. It's the wife of your youth. It, it was the one that you began with, and it's the one you should continue with, and it's the one that you should end with, and yet you've dealt with her treacherously. And there are many who do that. They, they think they're outgrowing the woman. Well, the Bible says that God gave Adam a helper that was comparable to him. When it says he gave him a helper, that word helper is a counterpart of himself, one formed from him, a perfect resemblance of his person. She was not less nor better, just different, corresponding to his exact need. Eve was neither inferior nor superior, but was in all things like and equal to him. The, the term a helper comparable, well, the idea is that she should be his complement to fill up that which is lacking in him. She is a match for him at his side, which makes her fit for him, corresponding to him. Someone said Eve was not taken out of Adam's head to top him, neither out of his feet 
to be trampled on by him, but out of his side, to be equal with him under his arm, to be protected by him near his heart, to be loved by him. A key to understanding this is a woman is not less, nor is she better. A woman is intended to be a complement, not a competitor. The rabbis taught that the wife is not a man's shadow so much as his other self, his helper in a sense which no other creature on earth could be. Again, Eve was not less nor better, just different, corresponding to his exact need. Our, our mates fill in our gaps and help to complete us. And I've noticed that in marriage. It seems that we can be attracted to people who fill in the gaps of our lives. Now, obviously, we end up marrying people who are very much compatible to us. We match well intellectually and financially, sexually, spiritually. Those areas line up. But in some of the non-essentials, we can actually find completion with people who are not similar to us in some of the areas of our life. And I've seen that. Some of you have too, if you're married. You might be a person who is really punctual. I mean, you'll say, church starts at 1045. Not many of you, but you may be. <laughs> and the person you're married to has one more thing to do. Just one more thing. I have teased my wife. I have said, honey, you're going to be the last person up in the rapture. <laughs> when that trumpet sounds, Maria will be going, I'll, I'll, I'll be right. I just have one more. <laughs> and me, over time, I've become very punctual. And so I discovered that there are sometimes similarities as well as dissimilarities. You know, somebody may be very, very clean, very fastidious. They, they want to make sure the house is always just right. And then you, you marry somebody who's, who's kind of messy, you know, put something down there and, and leaves it there because that way they know where that is. And they'll be able to find it later on. You may be a very, very quiet person. You know, you're real quiet and subdued, but you, you, you married someone with a, a ton of personality, very outgoing, and all, and that's good because it fills the gaps of your life, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's, there's something great about that, to be honest with you. You may be somebody who's very generous, but you married somebody who's <laughs> not. You may be somebody who is, is very cheerful, you just got a cheerful disposition. Everything's great, and you married someone who's grouchy. <laughs> Do you ever wake up grumpy? I used to. Now I let her sleep. And then, um, <laughs> actually, my wife is very cheerful. She's a very cheerful person. She wakes up laughing. How could she help it? She turns and looks at me. Oh, <laughs> You may be somebody who's very, very active, and you marry somebody who's not quite so. You may be a very optimistic person. Everything is sunshine. You know, you see the, the glass, you know, half full, and that person doesn't even see the glass, you know, a pessimist. <laughs> you may be a person who is very creative, and things have to change, and you marry somebody who likes things the same. You may have married somebody who's very patient because you're very emotional, you may be somebody who's very serious, and you marry somebody who's kind of silly. That's kind of how it works. And it fills in the gaps of your life. And it's good. I'm a very quiet person. I'm not as quiet as I pretend to be, to be honest with you. Marie can tell you that. But my wife is just the most amazing. And I say this every time I teach this because it comes to mind. We're on a plane, and Marie will always be seated next to the passenger that I don't know because she talks. She enjoys them. I do too, to a degree. Maria, will, well, I'll give you an example. I've given this before. We went to Israel. We're on a plane coming back from Israel. Israel's a long flight, a long flight. You're looking at 16 hours. And so it takes a while to get home. And in this particular flight, we had stopovers, which increases the time. And so we are seated, 
and I get near the window, and Marie's the center seat, and then there's a passenger next to her, and I know my wife, and this is a fact. I'm telling you a true story. I'm sitting there looking out, pretending I'm looking out the window, and this person we don't know is seated next to Marie, and I'm thinking to myself, how is she going to begin the conversation? Because I know she's going to. My wife is going to visit with the seatmate. She's going to do that. That's Marie. And so I, I, I'm looking at the window, pretending I'm looking out, but I'm watching her reflection. Because I see her, and she looks. And, she, and she, I'm going to talk to this person. And she turns and speaks to the woman, but the woman speaks Hebrew. Oh, I, oh, I said, oh, this is a challenge. Will she rise to the challenge? She can't. She can't. She cannot sit silently. What is she going to do? And I'm watching Marie. She says something, and the woman in Hebrew says, you know, and then says, no, I know, I know speak English. And Marie goes looking at her. And Marie says, habla espanol. And the woman says, oh, see, sí. She was a, <laughs> she, it's a fact, it's a fact. She was, she was a Spanish Jew. And I'm thinking, okay, when are they going to be crying and holding each other? When we got to L.A., this Jewish woman, Marie spoke to her all those hours. We, got, we helped her with her luggage. The woman is holding Marie, crying on her, and Marie's crying, holding Grandma. Me, I just said, hi, how are you? I know speak English. Well, all right. I'm telling you, that's my wife. And so the Lord has filled in the gaps of my life with her. And I think that we all, those of us who are married, can probably say something very, very similar to that. You see, what happens is we, we actually begin to learn from one another. And as we're learning from one another, we begin to accept one another. And we especially need to learn over time how to accept one another for who we really are. Because when you're dating, oh, you are the, whatever you think they want, that's what you are. What kind of food do you like? Oh, I like this, oh, me too. <laughs> you know, everything is a me too kind of thing. How about this, How, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And then you get married and the mask comes off, I hate that food, never like that music. <laughs> And so what happens is you actually, when you get married, because when you marry properly, when you're actually the real person, that's what I decided in, in my relationship with Marie when she and I began to date. Because I, I was one of these chameleons, you know, what is it you like? Where do you like to eat? What kind of entertainment do you like? I was one of those, yeah, I'll do whatever it is that you like so I can potentially uh, win you over. And I got tired of that. And I finally said, you know what? I finally got to that. I said, you know what? You know, who I am is who I am. I'm not going to change for you or anybody else. This is who I am. And I didn't do it in a mean way. It was just this mentality. I'm always putting on a new face or a different mask, and I'm trying to win people based on who I'm really not. So, and I would do that with Marie. And so when we would go out on dates, I, would, uh, I wouldn't say, where do you want to go? I'd say, Marie, I'm going to go here. Would you like to go with me? So she got to see the real David. I didn't try to... to um, do anything that wasn't me. And she actually liked the real me. So I've never had to wear a mask of somebody else. I've always been me, just who I am. And so from that platform, we were able to develop a real relationship. You see, what happens is you can't really change somebody by commanding them anyway. You better change or else, or else what? Or else what? So the way you change somebody is change yourself. We have a tendency of influencing each other. I am a person who responds to change in my wife. As my wife changes, I change along, I adapt. As I change, she adapts. And, and that's how we refine one another and that's how we're being transformed over the years. So it's not like a list, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this or else, I won't. It's a matter of I chose to be with you as you are. I love you as you are. That doesn't mean we're perfect, doesn't mean that we don't need change, but it certainly acknowledges the fact that that your commands aren't going to change me. And Marie knows that. My wife knows that. And she can't command me to change. I'll adapt to her. I love her. I'll do what I can to please her.
but she can't change my heart. She can't change my mind. That comes from the Spirit of the Lord and a willingness on my part. And when I see that it blesses her and she wants this from me, I take it before the Lord and I say, God, if that's what she needs, help me to become that man. But it's not because she's telling me to, it's because she influences me in that way. And I adapt to her and she adapts to me. And so God brought this woman to be comparable and they were able to create that oneness that was intended. It's interesting when you look in, in verses uh, 19 and 20, uh, then it makes it very clear that out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, every beast of the field. But for Adam, it was not found a helper comparable to him. It's, it's interesting how God brought the animals to Adam and Adam named them. That gave Adam the opportunity to exercise dominion over creation. He was created for this. He exercised authority, and he exercises leadership. You see that in the home also, by the way. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7 says, woman is the glory of man, and goes on in verses 8 through 9 to say, man is not from woman, woman from man, nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. When it says woman is the glory of man, she is a real reflection of him in many ways and his influence. I, I still remember my father telling me that he had heard a man complaining about his wife, and this was before my dad was a Christian. And my dad said to me, does that man not understand how bad it makes him look when he complains about her? My dad already had this mentality that a woman is the glory to the man. If somebody wants to be in ministry, and they come to me and they say, I'd like to be in ministry. One of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to see if the wife is a biblical woman. Because his real ministry isn't going to be in the church. His real ministry is in his home. And if his wife is a woman who loves the Lord and all, that's a great testimony of the effectiveness of his, of his ministry. And so he's, giving, he's been given authority and, and, and all. And, and he also, in this time had been given uh, the opportunity to experience what it means to be alone. You see, when the, the animals were being brought before him in pairs, that, that helped him to awaken to the reality of a natural longing for someone like himself. And so as this is taking place here, verse 21 says, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. He brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And so God intervenes. He takes the initiative on behalf of Adam. He, notice he took a rib. That word rib, incidentally, is a word that can speak of an entire side, not simply a single rib. So he takes this and he fashions. That word fashion means to build. He made her and he brought her to Adam. And she was brought as a design for his blessing. But as this is taking place, notice how it says that God put Adam into a very deep sleep. God knew Adam's need before Adam even realized that he had such a need. It's like what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 8, your father knows what things you have need of before you ask. So God knows. And so at this point, I'd like to make an application. And that would be, this is where many singles need to be asleep to desires for marriage. And I'll speak for a moment to the unmarried here. I would say that if you have a desire to be married, some have a, a gifting of the Lord, and you have no desire for marriage. It's also called wisdom. Um, <laughs> God knows your need, and God knows your desire. And so I would say to you this, I would say please do not rush into dating relationships, because by rushing into a dating relationship, it can ultimately cost you. You need to remember that there are worse things 
than being unmarried. And one of the worst things is being unequally yoked with someone who does not love the Lord. And if you marry a person who's not a Christian, you're going to bring sorrow upon yourself and you're going to disobey the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul said it like this. He said, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? So if you're unmarried and you have a desire to marry, my pastoral advice is to wait. Wait for the Lord to bring the best to you. You see, right now you're free to serve without any distractions. Now, single parents have an especially difficult time, but rushing into a bad marriage makes it even worse. You see, pressures in marriage often cause tremendous frustration. In 1 Corinthians 7, verses 32 and 33, Paul said, I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And that's true. I did a Bible study. I was talking to some of the young men after the study, and, and there were two or three of them, and they said, Pastor David, you want to go out for some coffee? And I started laughing. I said, I'd love to, but I'm married. I'm married. Yeah, but you know, I, said, I said, boys, I'm married. I, I said, I'd enjoy it. You know, I actually do. I mean, I, I like sitting down with the young guys. I love to visit with them. I enjoy hearing their stories and ministering to them. I love to do that. That's why, for me, men's things are so important. That's why men's retreats are so important. That's why men's breakfasts and, and, and things like that, you know, the M2M ministries, things that relate to men, I love it. And, and I enjoy it, but I can't always do that because I care about how to please my wife. And, and she's my priority. And so when you're single, you can be a missionary. When you're single, you can do a lot of ministry. When you're single, you can travel. There are many things you can do that once you get married, may be curtailed or at least modified. So remain unmarried until the Lord brings somebody and then, then bring that into your life. Now, as, again, speaking to the unmarried, if you are presently dating... If you're presently dating, evaluate your present relationship and be mature enough to establish dating criteria. That's not, that's not unwise, but wise. It seems that sometimes we can be more careful when we buy a car or buy clothes than when we make decisions for our life. Don't just go out with anybody. Be particular about who you date because the person you date is the one you're going to end up marrying. When my kids were younger and they were wanting to go out and all, and they were in high school, and they might say, I'm going to go out with somebody, I would say to them, are they believers? And they would say, oh, yeah, they go to church. And I'd say, no, I didn't ask whether they went to church. I said, are they believers? Because sometimes you don't really evaluate from that particular perspective. And you need to really be wise because you need to, to realize this is leading to something else. I, I still remember hearing from my kids on occasion, Dad, I'm not marrying them. We're just going out for a date. And I said, you know, I married the girl I dated. I mean, that's how you connect to be married as you begin through dating. So be wise in your dating. And so I really believe that you need to establish priorities and you need to hold fast to them. Also be aware that there's really no such thing as missionary dating. I know that you want to be a missionary for Jesus and this and that. But there's really no such thing as missionary dating. You know, you ultimately are going to reap what you sow and you can be terribly hurt if you don't get your life together in the Lord and you think that you can just go out with unbelievers and not be infected by them or to not be influenced by them. And so because of that, and because I've been doing this for a while, I, I developed some questions that I ask. I've modified them a bit, added a few things. Some of you have heard these in the past. But these are things that I would invite you to begin to think about, just a series of questions. 
and I'm going to just kind of rapid fire spit them out, but I hope you can kind of hear some things and connect with them. And I'll begin by saying, and this is a lot of questions, are they really Christians? What is it about them that makes you believe this to be true? If they are believers, how would you describe their walks? Or does that even matter to you? Is, is it okay if they say, yeah, I'm a believer, I'll go to church? You know, there are guys I've known in the past who will be anything that woman wants them to be. And if she wants a Christian man, then he's a Christian man. He'll go with her to church because she invited him. But he's not, he's not interested in what's being said. Oh, he'll nod his head, sing the song. But once they're connected, he has other things to do. And when he has those other things to do, they take her away from what she was doing because she's now more in love with him than she is with the Lord. I had somebody I knew, true story, a woman I knew many years ago now who came and spoke to me after a study and said, I got married last year. I was bringing the man to church. And he would come to church and he would listen to the study, nod his head in agreement, convinced me that he had a relationship with the Lord. So we got married. And he has now told me I can't go to church anymore because he is God and I'm to worship him. That happens. That happens. He has taken the place of the Lord. What should I do, Pastor David? And so that happens. Be aware of that. Be aware of that. And so is your walk with Jesus improving? Are you getting closer to the Lord because of a relationship? Or is your walk with Christ declining? You used to pray. You used to worship. You used to serve. Are you still doing that? Or are you discovering that you're too busy to do that because you have things to do now on Sunday? Do you together read the Word of God? Do you fellowship with other believers? Do you pray together? Have you ever taken the time to share your faith together with other people? Do you attend the same church? Are you willing to change your church home to go to their church? Does that matter to you? Who is the spiritual leader? Is it the man or is it the woman? If you don't go to church, do they go to church without you? What is it about them that you like the most? Is it their looks? Is it their personality? Their education? Their finances? Is it their walk with Christ? Another question, are you, are you keeping physically pure in your relationship? Are they telling you how much they love you and, and encouraging you to have sex with them? Some have sex but they don't know anything about the person that they're dating because it has simply become part of the date. Are you calling them your fiancé and living together? Well, the Bible calls that fornication, and that is a sin, and you need to repent and deal with it. And that's the reason why we, have, we had a community wedding, and we're planning on having another to help you guys to get your life together. Do you find yourself making excuses for them to your friends, families, strangers, and even yourself? Have you ever found yourself having to do that? You just don't know them. Well, you know that person, you're, the guy you're dating is kind of, you just don't know him. It takes a while to get to know him. You'll see he has a heart of gold. Really? Really? But dad and mom, when you walk out of the room, they say, oh, okay, should I kill him or should you? This isn't the right guy. This isn't the one that I prayed for. And so keep that in mind. If you find yourself making excuses for them to friends and family, sometimes even strangers, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong here. And so what does your family say about this person? Does it matter what they say? Or do you think they're just intruding in your personal life? You're a big person. You can make up your own mind. Will you listen to them at all? Do you feel obligated to stay with them because you've been with them for so long? 
Do you think that they're the best that you can get, so you might as well live with it? And when you go out on dates, what do you do on your dates? Because what you do is a test of where you are in the Lord. This person that you're dating, are they overly dependent? Are they selfish? Are they jealous? You may think that's cool. Oh, they're jealous. They really love me. Well, they also may be looking at you as a possession and not a person. And you think you're being protected, but you're really being kept from being who you're supposed to be. You know, when there's a certain place in a relationship where it stops being just a um, going out on a casual date and it becomes more intense. And there's a certain kind of healthy sense of, I'll use the word possession, I'd rather use a different one, but a certain sense of ownership, if you will, in terms of relational, that is fine. And I've said this to you before, but it's like this. It's like when Marie and I, my girlfriend at that time, well, before she was my girlfriend, when she and I would go out on a date, and I was around a lot of my friends and all, Marie being as friendly as she is, she'd go and speak to some of the guys. The guys would speak to her, and I'd just look, and I'd say, oh, she's keeping busy. That's good. I'll visit with my friends. I didn't think anything of it. I never did. But when I began to feel a little more inclined towards an exclusivity, this is my girl, I got a little more possessive with her. I did. You know, I, I can still remember we went, to, I can tell, we went to a beauty contest my cousin was in. She didn't win because she's ugly. But we went to a beauty. <laughs> That's what Don Trump's, Trump said. But anyway, we went, <laughs> we went to a beauty contest that my cousin, who was a very beautiful young woman, I'm just teasing, she was in, and Marie went as my date. I can still tell you what she was wearing. She was wearing a red pantsuit, and her hair was all oh, wild and crazy curly. And I was standing in the foyer when she came walking towards me. And when she came walking towards me, I was looking at this girl, and I was thinking, she's good looking. I had never thought like that. I really hadn't. I thought, well, she's pretty. She could be in this beauty contest. I'm thinking that when she walks by this big old guy, and the big old guy looks at her and just follows her as she's walking by. And I'm thinking, well, I can't do anything. <laughs> I'm not ready to die. So you know what I did? She came walking towards me. I took her by the hand, pulled her, and I gave her a kiss. And then I looked at him. <laughs> what? <laughs> what did I do? I took ownership of the relationship. And it isn't a jealousy in that evil way. You can't do this and you better not. It's more, no, we're committed. I'm going to commit myself to this woman. So I'm not talking about this weird possessiveness. You know, you can't go and you can't do it. And I saw you and going through that iPhone, looking at messages. Who did this? Who is this? Who is this? Who is this? No. If you can't trust them, you shouldn't be with them. You shouldn't be with them. You got to trust him. Amen. Because you'll ruin the relationship. After a while, you just get tired of that nonsense. At first, it's flattering. After a while, it's a burden. So you don't need that. And so anyway, it's not that you shouldn't have a sense that this belongs to me, but is a proper kind of sense. And so the question continues, do they control you? Do they bully you? Do they make you cry often? There are times in every relationship where we learn one another's ways and, we, and, and, and we'll say things that we shouldn't have said or say, it in a, say something in a way we shouldn't have spoken. But that's not the habit. That's the thing we learn from. We don't want to do that. We don't want to bruise. We don't, don't want to hurt. But do they bully you and, and actually take a joy out of making you cry? Do they make you feel good or do they make you feel worthless? Now, when you're alone with this person, what is it that they say about your mom or your dad or your sister or your brother? Do they have good things to say or do they say, oh man, I can't handle this and, and intrude on your family relationships? How often do you see them anyway? 
Do you rush home and call them up? Or now, you don't even have to rush home to call them up. You just say, good night, get in your car, go to the phone. You might even do a little selfie conversation. Hey, baby, I'm driving home. How are you? It's been three minutes since I've seen you. I miss you, honey. I miss you so much. Put your phone on your pillow so I can hear you breathe. <laughs> You're crazy. I called Marie twice a week, if at all. If at all. And that would just be to confirm when I'm coming over. I'll be there at a certain time, and okay, that was it. To this day, Marie doesn't, Marie will call me. But our conversations on the phone are very short. I hate talking on the phone. I'm not a phone talker. I don't like it. You know, and she knows that. Hi, baby, what you doing? Nothing now. No, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Talking to you. I'll be coming home. Okay, I'll see you in a minute. So, but if you're one of these people, oh, honey, I'm thinking of you, but you just left. I know. I can't get my mind off of you, girl. That's kind of sick. Be careful. <laughs> do, you do, do you do domestic duties for them? Are you doing their wash? Making their food? Stop. Stop it. Especially the wash. There are a lot of young women who do the wash for their boyfriends. That is telling me something about your relationship. That's so personal. You don't do that. You don't have to pretend you're a wife or a husband. You're not married. Continuing, are they always in between jobs? Do they borrow money from you or your friends? Do they like nice things and charge up their cards so they can buy those things? Are they responsible financially? Do you end up paying for your dates? if you're a young lady, and excuse it by saying, well, we're going to get married, so it's okay. Like I tell you, every time I teach this, Marie got mad at me one time because I only spent $10 on our date. That's all she had. <laughs> she had more, I'd have been more generous. Be very careful with that. What things do they do that irritate you? And do you plan on changing them? You know that cute little laugh becomes a cackle. You know, I, I've said this, I always say this because it's practical when I used to do the, the premarital and the young man whom I refer to as the victim, when he would be in... <laughs> I like that. But when he was, when he'd be there looking all starry-eyed and his girl would be next to him and, and I'd look at him and I'd say, what are you going to change in her? Everybody sees things about that other person through a dating relationship. That's what dating relationships are supposed to do, by the way, is expose the things that need to be worked on so us to get together. So what do you plan on changing in her and the young man? And I did a lot of premarital counseling, and I don't remember a single one of them ever saying, oh, this bothers me about her. They normally would say something like this. I'd say, what about her needs to change? What, what can irritate you? And they would say, uh, nothing. And I'd say, how long have you been dating? Well, we've been together for so long. And, 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 and nothing, nothing she does bothers you? Nothing? No, no, she's fine. So she's perfect? Yeah, yeah, she's fine. And he'd look at her like, oh. And so I'd turn to her. I'd say, baby, young lady, what are you going to change in him? She'd go to her purse, pull out this list. <laughs> Alphabetically or priority? They always had something that he needed to change. Always. And so just be aware of that. Just be aware of relationships like that. You're not going to change them. Remember that. Not by command. 
but by influence. Now, this is a question that today is very important to, to, to ask. Are they free to date? Oh, well, they're separated. You're planning on marrying someone who's separated? Yes. You're dating somebody who's separated? Yes. Didn't work out. Okay. You're dating someone who is presently married? Well, when you put it that way, well, what other way can you put it? What other way can you put it? If you're not free to marry them, you're not free to date them. What if the Lord wants to heal that marriage? You have to leave it in the hands of the Lord until he takes care of it. And you need to be aware of the circumstances surrounding any separation. Because some guys or some ladies are immediately in a new relationship the moment they decide the old one doesn't work anymore. And so you have to be aware of that. If you're not able to marry them, you shouldn't be dating them because they are married. Now, if they have been married and divorced, why were they divorced? If they have children, are you prepared to work through being a father or mother to them? If you have your own children, what plan do you have to blend those families? Can you get along with the previous spouse? Are you prepared for the different parenting styles that you will have and for any of the behaviors that you will experience after they come home from a weekend visit with your divorced spouse? If they are older, how do these children feel about you? Can you work everything through? Are you prepared to deal with exes? Don't idealize this. It takes real work and maturity to live in that kind of situation. Some of you know exactly what I'm saying. It takes real work. Is this really God's best for you, or are you just getting anxious? My advice, wait for God's best. Serve God first and wait on Him. I say this again every time I teach because it is very real. I wanted to get married. I prayed and sought the Lord. I told God I, I want to get married, and you know that. One of my friends said to me that like Adam had been put to sleep by the Lord and Eve was brought to him, my friend George said to me that's what he did, and that's how he met the woman he married. I took that to heart, and I said to the Lord, I have made bad decisions in the past, and I want you to protect me against making another bad one. I just want to delight myself in you and serve you. My brother got saved. I started teaching a Bible study. I was teaching the Bible study at his house in the city of Ontario. He invited some friends. A young woman walks in. He introduces her to us. She doesn't know the Lord. She gets saved in the Bible study. I was not interested in this young woman other than wanting to see her right with God. My sister Madeline, within about three weeks or so of, of this young woman coming to the study, my sister Madeline leads her to the Lord. And that's how I connected with Marie. And that's how we dated. And that's how we got married. I had said to God, put me to sleep to myself, to my desires, like you did with Adam, may I be asleep to mine. And please, Lord, would you bring the right person to me? And my Lord was very faithful to do that. Now, my son Joseph comes and speaks to me, and he says, Dad, you know how you have said about how you met Mom and all? And I said, yes. He said, I chose to make the same kind of prayer, and I asked God to put me to sleep to my desires. And I said, that's a good prayer to pray. He said, well, the problem I'm having, Dad, is I only did that a couple weeks ago or so. And he says, and I've met someone at the church that I'm really attracted to. And now I feel like I'm violating my promise to God. And I said, I laughed. I have to be honest with you. I laughed. I said, son, I've never filled in that story by telling everybody that it wasn't more than two or three weeks after praying that the Lord brought your mom into my life. He says, really, Dad? I said, yeah. I said, really, son? And so he dated this little girl who is now his wife. 
He did the same thing that I did. Lord, put me to sleep to my desire. Bring the right one to me. I have to say, my daughters-in-law are loved by this father-in-law as if they're my own babies. And I believe that God does that. He brings the right person into your life. And God says through Adam, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. She was taken out of man. He actually sings. This is a song. He's actually singing. And the song is, is identifying three things. It shows us that he has a full awareness of her derivation from him. She is flesh of my flesh. It recognizes his authority because he continued his role in naming her. This is woman. And he recognizes that she has kinship. She is from me. And so he says, leave. And he says, cleave. Verse 24, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. They shall become one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. They were innocent. They were open. They laughed with one another. They fellowshiped with one another. They loved God together, and they loved one another deeply. Two perfect people in a perfect marriage, and that is what God intended for them, to leave and to cleave. I want to close by sharing something about a couple by the name of Gordon and Norma Yeager. They were married 72 years, 72 years. And so here's the story of Gordon and Norma. Family said the story of Gordon, 94, and Norma Yeager, 90, is a real life love story. On the day she graduated from high school, Norma promised to spend forever with Gordon. The couple got married on May 26, 1939. They're very old fashioned. They believed in marriage till death do you part, said son Dennis. They just loved being together. Everybody argues once in a while, but my dad said, I have to stick around. I can't go until she does because I have to stay here for her. And she would say the same thing. Dennis said the couple left home to go into town, but they didn't make it. At an intersection, Gordon pulled in front of an oncoming car. The crash report said the other driver attempted to avoid the crash, but was unable to stop. I rushed from Des Moines where I was working and saw them in the hospital, said Dennis. In the intensive care unit, nurses knew not to separate Gordon and Norma. They brought them in the same room in intensive care and put them together, and they were holding hands in ICU. They were not really responsive, said Dennis. Gordon died at 3.38 p.m. while holding hands with his wife and the family that they had built surrounded them. Dennis said, it was really strange. They were holding hands, and Dad stopped breathing. But I couldn't figure out what was going on because the heart monitor was still going. But we were like, he isn't breathing. How does he still have a heartbeat? The nurse checked and said they were still getting her heartbeat through him. At 4.38, exactly one hour after Gordon died, Norma passed too. Dennis said neither one of them would have wanted to be without each other. I couldn't figure out how it was going to work. We were very blessed, honestly, that they went this way. They just loved being together. At their funeral on Monday, Norma and Gordon held hands in their casket. Family said they'll be cremated, their ashes mixed together. His heart continued beating through the heart of his wife. That's love. My heart beats with the heartbeat of my wife. That's love. And that's why Jesus would say, what God has put together, let not man put asunder. We are one in Christ.